Namaste. So the materialists, the Sankhyas, those who want to divide the material world into different elements and compounds and say that the cause of everything is some combination of atoms, will stoop to anything, I mean, any kind of argument, no matter how flawed, and they don't mind changing their position and offering different explanations for everything as long as it is resting on the assumption that matter is the cause of consciousness. That is their actual platform. They cannot bear the thought that actually consciousness is the cause of everything. Uh, because without consciousness, there isn't anything. No life, no world, no happenings, no events, no phenomena, nothing. So anyway, let's see how these Sankhyas flip-flop in trying to address the arguments of Vedanta and then how Vyasa answers them with a perfect rejoinder, Sankhya. It may, however, be held that the word self can be applied even to the insentient pradhan, for it performs everything for the self. This is just like using the word self in such an expression as Bhadrasen is myself by a king in respect of a servant doing everything for him. As an officer serves a king by engaging himself in making peace, waging war, etc., so Pradhana serves the self, the all-pervasive conscious entity, by arranging emancipation and enjoyment for it. Or the same word self can mean both sentient and insentient things, for such expressions are used in common parlance as the elements themselves, the organs themselves, the supreme self, etc. Just as much as the same word jyotis, fire is used for a sacrifice as well as a fire. So how can it be inferred from the use of the word self that seeing is not applied in a secondary sense? Vedantin. Therefore the answer is being given. Tinishtasya moksha upadeshat moksha upadeshat because liberation is taught Tanishtasya, for one devoted to that. Pradhan is not the meaning of the word self, because liberation is promised for one who holds on to that. The insentient Pradhan cannot be implied by the word self, for the supersensuous existence forming the topic under discussion is referred to in the text, That is the Self. Chandogya Upanishad 6, 7, 8, and then by saying, that thou art, Ibidam. The need of devotedness to it is advised for a sentient being who has to be liberated. Still later, liberation itself is taught in the words, one who has a teacher knows. For him there is but that much delay as is needed for freedom from the present body then he becomes identified with reality. Chandogya 6.14.2 If by saying, that thou art, the scripture should make one understand the insentient pradhan to be the meaning of the word reality, that is to say, impart the instruction, thou art insentient, to a sentient being desirous of liberation, then the scriptures, speaking contrarywise, will bring evil for a man and lose its validity. But the scripture, being free from defects, should not be fancied to be invalid. If, however, the scripture, 
authoritative as it is, should tell an ignorant man aspiring for liberation that the insentient non-self is his self, he will not give up that outlook about the self owing to his faith in the scripture, like a blind man holding on to the tail of an ox. As a result, he will not know the self that is different from that non-self. And in that case, he will be deflected from liberation and get into trouble. Hence, it is reasonable to hold that, even as the scriptures advise about such true means as the Agnihotra sacrifice for one desirous of heaven, etc., so they also teach the aspirant for liberation about the real self in such texts as that is the self, Chandogya 6, 7, 8, that thou art, O Shvetaketu, Ibidam. On this view, the instruction about liberation to one sticking on to truth becomes justifiable on the analogy of one getting freed by taking hold of a heated axe. On the contrary, if instruction is imparted about something as the real self that is but indirectly so, this will only amount to a form of meditation called sampad, as contained in the instruction, one should meditate thus, I am the vital force. Aitareya Aranyaka 2126. And its result will be impermanent. But to speak of it in that sense as an instruction about liberation becomes inconsistent. Accordingly, the word self is not used in a secondary sense with regard to the inscrutable reality. The use of the word self in a secondary sense as in the case of a servant, in the sentence, Badrasain is myself, is justifiable since the difference between the master and the servant is obvious. Moreover, from the fact that something is referred to in a figurative sense somewhere, it is illogical to give a figurative meaning to something else when the only source of getting knowledge about it is verbal communication, for that will result in losing faith everywhere. So it doesn't make sense to misinterpret the word self as being insentient in any way. Because after all, we are all sentient beings. Otherwise, there is no meaning to inquiry about the self. And that self must be sentient because we are sentient. If our self were something insentient, such as the pradhan or some combination of material elements or atoms, that would be a contradiction. That would cause people to become deviated from the Veda's purpose of liberation. And sure enough, we see nowadays that people trained up in this materialistic idea that the self is the body and consciousness is a result of some neurological phenomenon or some nonsense like this, all have become atheists. And because of that, they cannot attain liberation. Why? Because they will not perform the preliminary purificatory activities such as religious sacrifice and so on. This is the problem. Yes, in one sense, from, from the ultimate point of view, God and religious activities and so on are imaginary. It's true. But from the point of view of a materialist, God is a reality, must be a reality, and he must have faith in that reality in order to raise himself up from gross materialism to at least faith. My Adi Guru Srila Prabhupada defined faith as unflinching trust in something divine. By divine is meant some subtle reality that is causative over the gross reality. In other words, God is the controller of the material world and the source of all the individual living beings. So, when we worship God, 
we draw closer to this reality. We come nearer to the source, the actual source, which is not God, but something beyond even God, because God is a form. So that's all right in the beginning, just as the Upanishads say in the Sampad form of meditation, to meditate on Brahman as the vital force, as space, as fire, and so, so many different types of meditation. But Vedanta Sutra says in the fourth chapter, all these forms of meditation are equal, and they give equal results. This is why we are non-sectarian. We do not deny any religious or philosophical views regarding the Supreme, because ultimately they all lead to the Supreme. Even in the beginning, if they're covered over by some concept like Brahman is the vital heirs, prana, or the sun, or the moon, or the deity in the temple. Whatever object is used as a locus for meditation on Brahman, that is ultimately to be done away with, neti neti, huh? and only Brahman will be left. I used the example previously of the jhanas taught by the Buddha and how they begin from mundane mental activities such as silencing the mind through concentration. And as they rise higher and higher, neti neti neti, huh? they reach more and more subtle levels until they finally get to the point of emptiness in the seventh jhana and in the eighth jhana, neither perception nor non-perception. This is right next door to nirvana or nirvana. And in this state, one can very easily realize Brahman. In fact, Brahman will appear spontaneously. <laughs> and you wonder, well, what is this light? Why is there this light when I meditate? Where does it come from and what is it? And one who begins to inquire into this phenomenon of light in meditation soon reaches the point where he looks behind himself huh, and finds the actual source of the light, which is beyond personality, beyond manifestation, beyond any kind of form, and which is senior even to the concept of God, Ishwara, the controller of all. This is Brahman. One need not give it a name for this method to be successful. In our old series on the secret of the golden flower, which is actually one of the more popular series on our channel, still today, the secret is given. One should look at the self as one's face is reflected in a mirror. And instead of thinking, I am looking at myself, to think myself is looking at me. And this, turning this around, turning the attention, instead of going outward, to go inward, is this whole secret of meditation. All the other techniques of meditation, including mantras and different forms of visualization, etc., etc., are simply steps on the path to this inversion or reflection of attention and consciousness to point back at the actual source behind our eyes, which leads to full realization of Nirguna Brahman. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.